entertainment, culture, news, sport, documentaries, movies. Often this can bring the nation together. Can we put a price on that? Okay, uh, welcome everybody to uh, this year's Workflow Solutions Seminars. Over the next few days we've got 20 seminars addressing different aspects of uh, the industry workflow, so uh, please come down to um, some more of them if you'd like to. Um, our first seminar today is talking about uh, the progress in launching the joint DPP and AMWA compliance certification program. And I'd like to introduce you to the gentleman on my right. First of all, uh, Kevin Burrows, who is the DPP standards lead uh, for Channel 4. Uh, Paul Druitt, who is the DPP compliance program test manager for ITV. And finally, um, last and not least, uh, Brad Gilmer, who is the executive director of the AMWA. So I, th I believe I'm handing over to uh, Kevin first. Thank you. So um, what we're going to cover today, I'm going to give a brief um, overview of why we launched the compliance program. And it may sound quite straightforward to most people, but just sort of a bit of the background to it. And then I'm going to hand over to Paul, who is actually running the program, who's going to go into a few more details about how it works and the processes. Uh, so why did we introduce it to start with? Um, you may think that by just creating a standard, that's all you need to do, and then manufacturers make products and it all works. Um, unfortunately, it's not quite that simple. Um, there, there are a lot of issues in terms of the detail to actually make you know, products work correctly. Um, we, we, we started off by um, looking at a lot of the products that were coming to market. Some were saying they were DPP compliant, but it wasn't really clear what that meant, and, and we felt we needed to put a bit of structure around it. Um, and in addition to that, we were testing through various interoperability programs, um, the different amounts of, of you know, different compatibility, compatibility between products, and found that we were getting quite a few issues and seeing quite a few issues. Uh, we had already put in place an uh, interoperability program where we met with the manufacturers and invited them along every quarter uh, where people were bringing products that created and read files and we were swapping them between them and that was, that was very useful but we felt we needed to go a bit further. Um, we needed really to be able to um, make sure that we, we could represent quality and consistency so we didn't want our members who were going to go off and buy products finding that they didn't work correctly. Um, and actually part of it was really to define what we mean by DPP compliance because just to say that on its own is, is very vague. Uh, and actually we wanted to make sure that we had a consistent set of testing standards so if a product did say it was compliant then there was a documented set of tests um, that could be shown that it could have passed. Um, and also we were very proactive in terms of we wanted to make sure our deadline of October this year for file delivery to the UK broadcasters was, was uh, met as far as possible. So we, we kind of really wanted to speed that process up a little bit to make sure that we could get there. So when we set out, we, we started off in March and um, it was really built on the back of the interoper interoperability days that we had already put in place. We'd had one at the end of 2013 and decided that we needed to kind of ramp things up a bit. Um, we set up a centralised test facility, uh, which Paul's going to talk more about in a minute, um, which enabled the creation of the files and, uh, the, and, and the evaluation of the, the different products that the, the vendors were working on. Um, we also were in discussion with the AMWA about how we could get a certification program together um, which is based on the AMWA AS11 specification. Um, and also con we wanted to carry out conformance testing and establish the criteria for the different types of products um, so that we could then get into a position of awarding certification. Um, one of the key things for the DPP, very, being very neutral, it was very much open to any of the vendors and equipment suppliers, um, who, you know, anyone who wanted to support the AS11 standard. And the programme itself was funded by five of the UK broadcasters, BBC, ITV, Channel 4, Sky and BT Sport. Um, 
Um, we've got a, quite a lot of members who we signed up, uh, about 25 or so at the moment. There's just a selection of the logos. So we've had a very good response. I've been very, um, very pleased with how many manufacturers have supported it. And uh, they've been quite proactive in, in working with us to get as far as they can. So really one of the keys to, or just, just a few of the things that uh, we, we felt would make this successful. Um, we were very much being very pragmatic about the test criteria. We couldn't go down to the nth amount of detail. We needed to take a view as to what we considered was essential to make it work at a, a sensible level. And um, you know, without spending three weeks testing every product, which just wouldn't have been um, sensible or, or viable. Um, we've had very great support from the, the system suppliers and, and manufacturers who've worked with us. It's been really encouraging. Um, I think also work, it's been very collaborative working. There's been no kind of competitive edge between the companies. They're all happy to sit in the same room and work together, which is really encouraging. Um, one of the other key things was ending up with a robust and, and very documented test process that we could follow and use consistently across the different products. Um, and I think every, so far, everyone we've spoken to just really sees the benefit of, of being through the programme and, and what we're trying to do. So that's been very encouraging. So I'm just going to hand over to Paul now, who's going to go into a bit more detail about the testing process itself. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. So I'm going to run through a few things. It's a very technical subject. I'll try not to get too technical, um, but it's a bit inevitable. And what I'll attempt to cover in the next five minutes or 10 minutes is uh, what is compliance about and why is it so important? I'll go over some of the experiences we've had and the approach we've developed to test in, and in fact tell you what we do, how we've gone about it. Uh, we've got two major categories that we've so far taken through the test process. There are still a number of devices that fit into those categories and there are some further categories we'll be working on after IBC. Uh, and it's important, I hope, um, that I can convey what a certificate actually means if you're a purchaser, what you can glean from the fact that it's a certified product and more importantly, what it does not mean. And then I've got a, one, one example from the industry of um, the application of the DPP standard to a real-world process for delivering to multi-channel platforms. So covering these things in that order. The AS11 DPP standard and what we're doing in the compliance program is all about file formats. It's not about the content, the video and the audio, and whether it's legal or flashing or the audio is high level or low level. It's really just about the, the structure of that file, the structure of the MXF, and the structure and data contained within it. And clearly, if we take this to basics, we have a very, very simple interoperability aim. If we can make files that conform to the specification, and we use those to play back in playback devices that can play back conformant files, then it will correctly play back. That's unambiguous. Those statements follow. In the real world, there are almost, with a couple of exceptions, no such things as perfect files. And it's almost impossible to test a playback device that it plays back all file types that are conformant to a standard. So we have to be pragmatic. And that's been our approach in the compliance program. So we've tackled it like this. Let's first of all understand the AS11 specification and know what we need to do for checking for full conformance. We need to then assess what's required for interoperability and be pragmatic. We can see that there are some aspects of the specification that must be adhered to. If you don't, you're almost guaranteed not to play a file. There are some aspects of the specification that you should follow and actually uh, they would normally be regarded as errors and against full conformance it would be a fail, but because those areas of variance are unlikely to trip up a product going through a workflow, uh, we've allowed them. And this is very important, it's the pragmatic approach. 
and in allowing some failures to go through as passes, we've set ourselves the idea of a certification level of testing. So full conformance checks would be looking at all aspects of the file. Certification level testing looks for things that must pass and it looks for things that should pass and we would like in time all products to not be uh, in error on things that should pass. Uh, and then there are some things that really it makes very little difference either way but it would be nice for full conformance if those were correct and we just raise those as warnings. So this introduces the idea that there is a level of testing that we can say that's a good standard to go for for devices writing files that are going to work in playback devices. If they pass we can test the writers for the creation of these files and we can test the readers that play back these files and that has been the basis of our thinking for certification testing. So in summary we we test to the ANWA AS11 specification but the UK DPP HD shims. We're only currently looking at HD, SD will likely follow and we've realized that as with all specifications there are always ambiguous elements. It's written in English, it's open to interpretation, some of the language is looser than ideal. So we've come up with a set of rules to try and tighten that language and to remove some of the ambiguity. Uh, we can identify a set of tests. There's now a set of tests on the DP website that uh, after today you'll be able to go to and look at the test suite that we apply and the decisions we make about things that we find. And we've uh, tested uh, devices and established this level of capability and this certification level. We've done this by looking at a whole range of real world files and we're quite confident we're there. We may change that in the future if we find playback devices don't play back a file but they are working within the spec then we'll have to review that and say well actually we do need to test for that feature because that is a requirement. So some of our re pragmatic relaxation we may have to review but we think we've got it pretty close. Uh, we've selected devices to carry out full conformance testing and we wouldn't expect today there to be a single device that copes with the full range of tests. Uh, I'll gloss over a few points but just to say that we use eight devices in the lab for full conformance checking. A couple of AQC devices, an MXF analyzer, uh, a trusted video and audio playback device, the DPP metadata app, and we've written three other scripts that expose information about um, essence descriptors that are just not revealed by other tools. And those eight tools give us all the information we need to know to be quite confident that we know everything about a file. So, HD file writers is one category and we, we now have this set of tests so we can test HD writers, devices that make a file, uh, test them to certification level and by using a batch of files that conform to that standard we've generated a way of self-testing readers in two categories, those that are straightforward video playback devices and those that are transcode devices. There are further categories and we'll be looking at those in the future like AQC tools, other analysis tools, metadata editors that edit in location and so on. But for the moment it's those main categories that we cover. So because of the way that we've been pragmatic about certification I think it's worth just pointing out what certification means and what it does not mean. And I'll read this out. So certification means the capability of a version of a product to read and or write files to the AMWA AS11 UK DPP shim specification. That has been tested by the DPP compliance lab and all the tests that we carried out as documented, documented have either fully passed or passed with conditions. And that's exactly what it means. What it doesn't mean that all modes and all features of a product have been tested. That would be impossible, certainly impractical. Uh, 
and it doesn't mean that all files produced by certified writers are always fully conformant to the AS11 DPP shims because we have allowed this uh, pragmatic approach to allow pass with conditions. And a direct consequence of that is that all files from certified writers um, this, uh, being certified doesn't mean that all files from certified writers will always work correctly with certified readers. And this is a subtle point. So we've, we think we've gone a huge way to be able to identify products that will interoperate. But you have to bear in mind that it's possible to configure a device, put in metadata that's illegal, do some configuration changes that cause it to produce illegal non-compliant files. We've proved it can make compliant files and we've proved devices can read those files. And, and that's really what certification means. So I'll leave you now just with the one real world example. Um, there's a colleague in the audience who's speaking this afternoon on a, a, a workflow solution session, which is uh, one of the UK broadcasters, ITV. They have uh, a project in full flight, which is content delivery modernization. And this is, I brought this up just to highlight the impact of the DPP standard in a real world situation. In 2010, linear broadcast for that UK uh, broadcaster was 100% tape based. There was very little asset management in the process of turning finished programs into delivery to multi-platform. Multi uh, no long form capability for transcode of those assets and the sort of volumes that they were delivering in terms of catch-up and VOD outputs were four catch-up partners and in the order of 20 hours per week. 2014, now 90% DPP file-based operation. Uh, the asset management records are now reaching around about 10,000 DPP master files having been processed. Two transcode farms outputting over 1,000 files a day and 30 catch up and archive platforms and partners taking something like 300 hours, all based around assets stored in a DPP format internally. And this program is about allowing program producers up front of this broadcaster use case, being able to deliver directly into broadcaster's receipt point as fully conformant uh, DPP assets. And with that, I'll hand over to Brad who is going to take us through the, the next phase of certification after the DPP has finished its work. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I'll tell you what. Go find the presentation real quick. No, it's a, the second one down. Alright, good morning. Thank you for bearing with the, uh, the sound here. My name is Brad Gilmer. I'm the Executive Director of the AMWA. And today we will cover the role of the AMWA in certification, the importance of certification to the industry, something new, the AMWA Certification Authority. So if you hear AMWA CA later, just remember that refers to Certification Authority. The relationship between the DPP and the DPP lab that Paul was just talking about and the CA. And we'll take questions as well, I think, as a group when we're done. Very briefly, the AMWA is not new. Uh, it was formed in 2000. And in fact, although the AMWA is partnering with the DPP, many of the DPP founders are members of the AMWA and in fact are, some of them are on the board of directors of the AMWA so it really is a, a close association. Our membership is about 50% 50 50 suppliers, 50% end users and uh, MXF was our fault <laughs> along with the SMPTE and the EBU. Um, and the uh, MXF had a very broad feature set. Unfortunately, that feature set led to interoperability issues that I think a lot of us know about. And the MXF application specifications that the AMWA have created helps to address some of the interoperability uh, issues. 
And the one that we're talking about today, AS11, is an application specification for finished programs, and that's really the basis of the AS11 DPP files that we're talking about for UK. In terms of certification, what we hope that certification brings to the whole uh, process here is first of all it increases user confidence, second of all it rewards vendors for all their efforts uh, that they've engaged in over many months, third and I think importantly it formally grants a legal right to use a logo and to make claims um, and that um, I think really allows us to only allow the people who have been through the rigorous testing and, and discussions that have been involved here to actually see the logo and, and hear the claims. And if it's done right, in the end it leads to better interoperability. And as you can see on the screen here, this is the uh, AMWA DPP certified logo that we'll be licensing to manufacturers. So, as we said, the AMWA operates a certification authority. The CA works with partners to convey the legal right to logos and make claims. Excuse me. <coughs> the CA does not establish the criterion for certification. DPP does that. We don't analyze the artifacts presented by applica applicants. The DPP does that. But we do convey rights based on the criterion established, in this case, by the DPP. <coughs> I apologize. I've been plagued by a cough. Uh, so this certification authority could serve not only the DPP, but other future partners as well. So <coughs> in terms of the relationship between the CA and the DPP, DPP establishes the criterion performs the test, notifies the vendors of the results. Optionally, the vendors may submit the DPP results to us for formal certification, and we grant the rights based on a simple comparison of the DPP criterion and the artifacts, and the artifacts, in this case, a test report produced by the DPP lab, and based on that, we issue the criterion. So, short, sweet, to the point. For more information, on our side, um, you can go there. And also, uh, Ms. Main just wanted me to mention that if you're